series this morning. And today's connector is going to be all about Office 365 users. And we're going to talk about the relevant people part of that, which is Office Graph. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you today. So I have a lot to show you. We're going to do a bunch of demos. I'm going to demo something I did before. We're going to do some stuff together. Um, so I hope you're all comfy. Don't worry, this is being recorded. So um, after it's over, you can come back here and watch it. In the description underneath the video, you'll also notice that I'll have links to important documents as well as to the apps that I'll be uploading to the app gallery that you can download and use in your own environment. Since our connector is Office 365 today, as long as you have Office 365, when you download my app sample, it'll just run in your world, okay? So uh, let's get started. I'm gonna share a screen because I have a lot of information to share with you before we start the demo. Okay, so as usual, just to share a little bit about um, Power Apps, I like to let you know that it's a software as a service. Most of you already know this, but I like to make sure it's repeated at the beginning of the video. And the whole goal of Power Apps is to create custom business applications that work across platforms. We use basically a three-step process to create those apps. We connect to data. After we've connected to data, we build a UI, so we add forms and controls and all the different things that make those forms and controls work without necessarily needing any code. And then finally, when, when the business is ready and when we're ready as individual power users, we can publish those apps live to our users. And uh, the users in this case, or the audience that we have is the, or is the people in our organization, the people found in our um, AAD or our active directory. And so, this empowers us to deliver solutions in our enterprise that normally would have taken much longer to develop using code and or using the resources necessary to reserve for, for uh, application design. So we're, we're hoping that this expedites innovation and enables a business to do more with less time spent on the investment of the UI. This series is focused on the number of connectors that we have. We have a lot of connectors. And so the last time I looked, we were somewhere around uh, 200, um, which is a lot. Um, if you go to um, our connector documentation, you'll be surprised how many there are. If you click on them, you know, especially if you go, I like to go to Flow's uh, portal, for example, flow.microsoft.com. At the bottom, if you click on show all connectors, it actually will take you to um, all of the connectors. And when you click on each one, it gives you a little description underneath as to what connector that is, what its purpose is or goal is. And it also give you a link to the documentation. And I have those links in this deck as well at the end that you can reference as well. But it's a good idea to go and visit our connectors. Um, one thing I suggested at the last uh, webinar was that you start searching the connectors by what you do every day. So if you're working at, in Azure every day, maybe you should search and see how many connectors relate to that. And that's what I've done with this URL you see at the top of this page. And it's a URL that I've actually got bookmarked in my browser. Um, it enables me to go ahead and search for what is in red here. I just change what's in red to uh, whatever it is I'm working with that day, you know? so. I like that I, I, I checked for Excel, for instance. You'd be surprised how many connectors relate in some way to Excel. And this is especially true when it comes to the templates. So you, just like you can search connectors, you can search templates. And the templates will often relate in, in many ways, right? Because they cover different areas of these connectors. Um, but I'm amazed at how many we have. Like I was surprised to see the cues here on this page, uh, it was a surprise, and I can't wait to build something that looks at the Azure queues. I thought that was pretty cool. But in this connector series, what we're going to do each week is kind of talk about different connectors. Now, I do want to remind you, again, you can look at the last webinar, or you can look at some of my earlier videos on getting started to learn more about Power Apps and these you know, web authoring tools and things like that. But when it comes to connectors, I do want to point out an important page that sometimes gets forgotten. And that's the connections page. So when you're in Power Apps, 
you used your app launcher or you used whatever you can to browse to web.powerapps.com. When you get there, you have a home page, an apps page, a learn page, and a connections page. That connections page is important because every time you add a connection to your apps, uh, they'll be stored here based on the environment that you're in, okay? And so each environment has its own connections. But sometimes connections can break and sometimes we can have more connections than we really needed to have. So we can remove connections. You can see this dialog box on this screen where I just basically clicked on those three dots and then tried to remove the uh, JIRA connection, which is the second one at the top. When you try to remove a connection though, be, we, we help you out so you don't break your apps. It'll list underneath which apps apply to those connections so, so that you recognize that deleting this connection would therefore impact that app, right? Um, so keep an eye on this page. Sometimes I mentioned that the last webinar, you'll see a red dot with a number in it, which means that that number of connections has some impact to it. Maybe your password has been forgotten or you changed it and since then it can't connect anymore. So keep an eye on your connections page, try and keep it neat and tidy. Um, and if you see any errors, try and resolve them as quickly as you can because they can impact how your apps run. If you're making custom connections, then you would be involved in that one underneath that, which is your custom connectors. So keep an eye on this page and, and be a good housekeeper when it comes to your connections. It only results in well-run apps. So today we're talking about Office Graph, which is actually um, basically part now of our Office 365 users connector. Um, Office 365 users used to be like 100% profile information and that's it. And then we added a new group called relevant people. And so I kind of want to take a minute and kind of explain what this is supposed to be doing so that you understand. So if you go to, I'm just going to stop this um, show for a second and kind of visit Delve. If we go into Delve here, um, in Delve, and those of you that know what Delve is, it's constantly looking at kind of what you're doing, who's working around you, what um, things are going on in that world. And this is basically the functionality is being driven behind Delve is Office Graph. And it's awesome because it enables you to learn a lot about things going on around you. So just want to show you some of the things that you learn here. So I'm just going to go back to here. And you'll see when you're looking at the Delve screen, which we were just looking at in real life in my portal, you basically have a few things. These four things on the bottom is what you see the most. You see recent contacts. And you see these are people that I'm working with often, and so they come up here. Trending documents. So underneath here that's been truncated that you can't see are the documents that people around me have been doing. And the ones at the top are my recent documents, which includes email attachments and um, other uh, content that I'm producing. And you'll notice that it says it's private, which means that if somebody was looking at my um, trending documents, they wouldn't see the ones that have been marked private, um, but they would see the ones that are not marked private. So this one's probably live for everyone, right? So um, this helps me kind of keep track of what I'm doing, what others are doing. And then when you talk about SharePoint, you get this fourth element, which is trending on this site. Now, when we talk about the Office 365 users connections, now having the re re relevant people, we're not saying that you get all of this functionality out of the box. So you won't yet see uh, trending documents um, yet. And you won't see anything related to SharePoint trending on this site yet, right? But if that's something you're interested in and you actually want more Office Graph functionality, you have basically two choices. One, if you're a pro dev, you can always extend the functionality using a custom API or a custom connector to Office Graph, right? Two, you can vote for more out-of-the-box properties in the out-of-the-box connector at this link up here. So we have an ideas form, forum, and there is already an idea about you know, user properties, but you might even want to add your own idea about what you'd like to see in to be added so that we get more of this Office Graph functionality. 
because we have a lot of opportunity here in integrating this into apps, both mobile apps and desktop apps. So I suggest if you're if you this really excites you, get involved, post ideas to the forum. If you have any problems with anything that I bring out today, please post that on our forums and we'll try and work those out with you. So we're going to actually talk about a couple of apps that I've built. So I have uh, I have built this little app here, which I'm still working on. It's called the Mentor Search app, right? And basically, you'll be able to search for mentors based on dip departments and or job titles, right? So right now, I have this simple UI here that basically just looks at my relevant people, helps me get to their LinkedIn profile, and might help me search for them. And even I can even chat with them, and I'll show you how that works too. We'll add that to this UI. I will finish this app for the Friday Functions video. So this is kind of, the app itself is gonna be two parts, this webinar and the Friday Function video that will finish this app, and then I will give it to you so you'll be able to have it as well. On the right side here, this phone app that you see, is an app I created to demonstrate profile. So in this particular app, um, it's actually looking at the current user firstly and kind of uh, pulling some information. And what I'm gonna use that app for is to kind of show you kind of the relationships between data because sometimes data in the profile is a single line of data, like your display name is just one line of data. But when it comes to certain properties like the skills that you might have entered, or the interest that you have, they are multiple. So they would go into say a gallery or a list box or something like that. So I wanna show you that difference. And there is a way to get to your OneDrive because we have a My Site launch link. So I'll show you how I did that in this particular mobile app. Um, on the bottom, you'll see the who I'm working with um, and I'll show you how to do that. And then um, my about me, right? So we'll look at these apps real close. We'll actually build the widescreen one together. We'll build that large one together and the small one we're gonna dig into. So uh, let's do that now. I'm gonna check for questions while we switch over to Power Apps. Hello, I see uh, Black Forest Germany on the webinar today, thank you. Hello, Stacy in Minneapolis, Minneapolis. So great to see you guys here today. All right, so let's go to Power Apps first, and I'm gonna show you my uh, mobile app first. So basically, I'll just run it first. And when it loads, it looks at whoever's looking at the screen. So the person who's looking at the screen, that's whose profile is loaded. And then I'll show you how to do that. And basically it shows, you know, my name, my department, my title. It gives me the about me. Now, again, all of these prof profile information, here's what they depend on. They depend on people filling out their profile details. And uh, for the most part, we can actually extend this app to enable them to edit their profile details, which I'll show you how to do. But I usually encourage people to go and to delve and just click, click update profile and you can update your profile attributes. Anything that's blank, you won't see. So sometimes if I wanna test, I'll go to Delve and look up a person, like here's Mackenzie, and then I'll look and see what profile properties she has. She hasn't filled out interest, she hasn't filled out hobbies. And so when I go and look at her profile, I shouldn't expect to see those that data because it's not available in the Active Directory. Um, and this is kind of something I want to explain to people. You, it, and it could be sometimes this is out of the scope of the power user. Like the power user can build the app and could wire it up for all the information, but the power user is not going to be able to make sure that the the profile has the information that's needed. And so usually I encourage you know um, IT pros as well as other people who are site admins or tenant admins to kind of encourage their um, people onboarding to Office 365 as part of their onboarding, encourage them to fill out their profile properties. All right, and uh, let's just go through a couple of other things here. So I have two projects, I have 17 skills and I have eight interests 
and those are just counts, so we'll look at these. But if I click on these, it, it pulls up a gallery over here on the left that basically tells me what those projects are. If I click on this, this is what the skills are. Um, so I think the second click is actually a, a turn it off, right? So this will turn it off, and then another click will turn it back on. Nope, I don't have eight interests. I might have, we might have to fix that control. Looks like it's wrong. All right, but everything else looks like it's working. I basically have too many of that. And then here, if I click this guy, it takes me to my OneDrive where I can look at my uh, document store. And so, but you can configure that to be anything you want it to be. It could be the path to a corporate document uh, center. And then that document center could filter by the author name of uh, Audrey Gordon. There's a lot of ways you could approach that whether, rather than it just going to the OneDrive. And then down here, these are the people that I collaborate with most. And if I click on them, then the whole thing switches to them. Now, the only thing that isn't switching to them right now is the um, is the bottom section, the collaborators. I actually didn't have that change, um, but you most definitely could do that. That would that totally be possible so that you see his collaborators. I left it my collaborators so that I could actually go through and look at each of my collaborators independently. I, I love Ankit's picture. So you can see, but he hasn't gone into his profile store and he hasn't changed any of his projects or skills or interests. So we don't know what he has. I think if I click on Sandy, no, nope, Sandy either. So it just depends again, what's in their profile store. And of course, you know, uh, a lot of things going on as far as what comes up here as far as their images, depends on the image, the image size, the image quality, all of that matters. Um, and this little reset to me, thing here is just enabling me to reset it back to my profile after I've been browsing others. So I just want to open this up and kind of show you a couple of things in here that you might find useful. And then we're going to build the bigger one together. So did I hit edit? I meant to hit edit. I don't think I hit edit. Let's hit edit. So profile, I'm going to hit my little pencil icon and I'm going to log in. This will bring me into edit mode of the app so that I can see the canvas and we can look at some of these controls. We'll just give it a minute. And in some cases, I may have to authenticate twice. Uh, depends on how, how many connectors are in the app. That can sometimes happen. So I authenticate until it doesn't ask me anymore. And here we are in the app. OK, so I'm going to start kind of looking at the galleries. Well, let's start with the simple stuff, which is like the image. So if we go into down here on the bottom, you see that I have a object called profile photo right here. Um, that was just an image control. So I just did insert media and chose an image control. And you can tell that by the icon of the uh, object in the Explorer. And all I do for that is basically insert the user photo function. Um, of course, I started this whole thing by adding the Office 365 user, Office 365 users connection. That's the only one that I needed in this case. Um, but then I can use all of those that come. So when you start typing, so let me just um, show you what I mean. When you start typing the name of the connector and you get to the dot, you will see all the groups that this connector has. Now, in some cases, you will see a V2. And I'm, I'm going to assume, and if uh, anyone from the connectors team is online, maybe you could clarify if I'm incorrect on this. I'm going to assume that V2 will have things that V1 doesn't have or the, uh, the standard one doesn't have. So what I've been doing is just trying them both and seeing what the difference is. It's, it's not 100% clear. You probably could do better explaining what the difference is between user folder photo and user folder photo V2. 
But then you see that these are all photo properties. Then you have direct reports, which gives you the ability to, to find the direct reports. Manager, you have my profile. Now my profile doesn't actually mean me, Audrey Gordon. It means the person looking at the screen again, right? And then we have relevant people. This is where that office graph technology comes in, where we find people that are relevant to us, or people that we've been working with, communicating with, and that the algorithms can pick up as common for us. Then we have search user, where we can search by a keyword. Um, and basically, when we're searching users, we're searching through um, the name fields, the display name, the given name, the surname, the name fields, and possibly the description field as well. Uh, the test connection, I wasn't able to figure out what that one means. I think basically it's just a connect, text to connection. Um, not 100% sure on that one, but usually I don't use it. Um, update, if you notice, we've got a whole set of update properties here where you can update your profile. So this is where you could add a button that says edit. If you're looking at your profile and you realize you haven't got any projects or whatever, you can just click edit my profile or update my profile and be able to update it directly from the app. So I will be extending both apps to that point. Um, user photo metadata, user profile, which could be any user. Now, in most cases, when you're doing this, it after you pick one, like in this case, I picked user photo, it's going to ask for the user ID. And this is very common. It wants to know whose photo, right? now. Um, the, the, the easy way to do this is there's two ways. You can do the, you can use the user function and just choose email of that user's function and that will work, right? Because the user function is the current person looking at the screen, their email. Um, the other thing I could do here is I could use the Office 365 users to find out um, whose profile this is. So I could do Office 365 users dot my profile, this is the person looking at the screen, or let's see, let's do my photo. No, I guess I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do Office 365 users. I want the email of the person looking at the screen, so I'm gonna do my profile, and I think I'm gonna do V2, and then I'm gonna do a dot. And then I'm going to do the principal name. So the user principal name is the same thing as an email address. It's the same thing. So that's a way you can get the current person looking at the screen. Now, you're probably wondering, Audrey, you didn't have that at all there, right? You had current user email. And I'll just show you that I'm using a variable there. And the reason I'm using a variable here is because I want to this picture to change when they click on one of these photos. And since I want the picture to change, I want that to be dynamic, depending on what the scenario is. If this is a logged in app, then when I first hit this screen, I did an on uh, visible that sets that current user email to the user email that's looking at the screen. I did that first. But I want to be able to use that uh, variable later on to change it to what one of these pictures are that I might click on. Now, I, I also passed a default in here for past projects. And I think it was just a testing situation. But I probably didn't need to do that because I did notice those come up as defaults when I change people's picture. But my on visible property is my way of capturing the current user and putting them into that variable. And this is a global variable, even though this is a single screen app right now. But I will be adding other screens to this app for editing the profile. And that's why I chose to use a global variable versus an update context variable. But this is the same thing as the user ID. This will hold the email or the user principal um, I, uh, name so that we get that email in there. And that's needed for a lot of things. So let me just show you. I'm going to go to selecting this one. So this is the name. Notice that, again, even I'm saying I want the user profile display name, but for who? Whoever is in that current user email uh, variable, right? 
And again, I could have used the user email if I wanted to always be the person looking at the screen, that would be the easy thing to do. But I wanted this to be dynamic so that whatever user I was clicking on, that would be what would change here. So this is probably the hardest part of what I did here. The rest is really easy because if you take this, this uh, sentence right here and you just keep changing what you want to see, you can see that I'm just changing to department. In here, I'm just changing to job title, all right? And that's how I get all my properties. In here, a little bit different. So up here, what I'm doing for this text is I'm going to find their past projects, but this is a this is a multiple value situation, right? Past projects is plural, so it can be more than one project. So what I'm doing is basically counting that. And I'm counting that based on that current user, and then I'm making sure we know how many past projects there were. There are two. Now on the on select statement, I do something fun to get that gallery to show up. So there's a gallery on the page that basically will show when I click on this on select. You can make it show all the time if you wanted to. Um, and then the part that's important here is that based on when they click on that, it actually creates a collection called my type collection where it puts these past projects. Now, what I did interesting is that I made the connect the collection not change. The collection is always my type call. So even if you're looking for skills, you go to the on select, it's still going into the my type call collection. I'm just changing what's in that collection. That's why I'm using clear collect because I want to clear the collection every time I change what I've touched on. And of course, you know, you might have chosen to put maybe an eye icon for information or something. How you how you expose this is up to you. I just chose to keep keep it simple and only show it if they solicited that information. And so because I'm using the same collection, let's check on this one because I think it didn't come up before. Let's check on select. We look here. Yep, that didn't get changed. So instead of past projects, that should be interest. Right? So basically, I'm just editing the same thing over and over. And now that's going to go into that collection. Now, there is a gallery on this screen called gallery details right here. And the gallery details is looking for that type column. This is important. I only need one gallery because the, the gallery itself, its items property is dynamic. It will change based on what I ask for. So again, if I run that and I click on two projects, now this gallery is showing me the two projects. But if I click here, this is going into a, to the same collection. So the gallery will show that. And then same thing here, if I click on this, it's, it's showing my interest. So by, by pushing the value into a collection, I could dynamically drive that single gallery. And this is something I kind of suggest, whenever you can do it, do it. And the reason being is because you want to keep your screens as simple as possible. The least amount of controls, kind of the better, right? So if you can drive a whole bunch of stuff using just one gallery, then you should do your best to do that. And usually you can do that using these, um, using these, uh, using a collection. Now, I want to point out here that I also wrap this in a proper field. I don't know if you guys know what proper is, but let me show you what happens if I don't put it in a proper field. So I'm just going to take the collection, right? Now, here's what happens. I hope you can see this. Whatever I typed in Delve, right? If I typed foreign languages, little case, and I type French language capital, so who knows what my mood says when I'm typing. But that doesn't look good on the app perspective. If you have like different things looking all different, you want to kind of make them all look similar, you know, in their format. So I did that by using proper. So basically, all I did was wrap this into proper. And what that does is it makes them all initial caps. What I don't like is it will make my an, the word an initial cap too, which is grammatically incorrect. But I bet you one of you could figure out how to work around that as well. But I like that. Also, it was helpful to use, and in the same line of thought with proper, I use that here as well. 
And, and that's because, again, the department was coming forth in my active directory as all caps. Was it the, No, it wasn't the department. I think it was this one was coming on, so all caps. And I didn't want inconsistencies in my app. You know, sometimes all caps, sometimes not all caps. Well, I guess, um, so let me see if I can get rid of this proper. And see if this is all caps. I believe it was all caps, which didn't make me happy. Yeah, see that's all caps. I didn't want it all caps. So I used proper to make it initial caps. You could also use lower if you wanted to make it all lowercase. Oh, I know. I'm in the middle of a Friday functions video, aren't I? But I didn't mean to be. So I'm just going to put it back. I just wanted to show you why it was wrapped in proper, because I'm trying to control some consistency on my formatting here. The other thing you might notice as I'm working, and I try to be very transparent here on this as well, is that my gallery looks kind of wonky while I'm working, right? It's kind of wonky. It's not kind of spaced all evenly, but when I play, it looks great. That's because I used a variable height gallery. So when I inserted my control, I inserted, sorry, a gallery, this one that's called flexible height. I used that because I didn't know how many items I would need depending on these different collections. So by using a flexible height gallery, it kind of fixes itself. And uh, I like when the technology does work for me, that makes me happy. So, but it looks kind of wonky when you're in when you're in edit mode, but when you press play, it fixes itself. And I think it's only like the first one that looks kind of wonk wonky, just for your FYI. Um, but yeah, you see how it went kind of, it's all spaced out. It's because it's a flexible height gallery. So don't be surprised when you see that happen. With your flexible height galleries, you should always preview. Um, this one here, just kind of highlight this one for you. This one is called My Site. Now, the My Site link will not work for anybody else but me. So basically what I should do is hide that if it's not me right? Um, because I'll get an access to lot denied on that my site. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I would really like to see what relevant documents in here, because I would love to expose the relevant documents right here. And then on this one, this is the about me. Now I was a little nervous about about me because a lot of people don't put an about it, me in their apps, I mean, in their Delve. Um, so I wouldn't take up too much space if you want this to be a dynamic screen. I wouldn't take up too much space on this because a lot of people don't fill it out. And down here are the collaborators. Um, this is another gallery called Gallery Related. And you can see that the items property right here is locked to the current user. But again, I can, I can change this, right? I didn't change it on purpose. Right now, this gallery will always reflect the collaborators of the current user. And my business scenario in my head, of course, was I want to browse the people I work with. That was my idea. I want to get to know them better, right? But if I wanted this to change based on the clicks in here that we did before, then I would change this to that variable current user email as well. But I didn't want it to change. So um, I do want to point out a couple of problems I had just so that you don't struggle with it. There were two properties that I couldn't get to pop up. I couldn't get to pop up uh, let's see, uh, and I'm going to, I think this is in V2. Um, current user email. I have my cat clock on. Okay, I got to make sure, capital V, right? So when you look at this dot, let me show you all that's possible there. There's a lot possible. V2 has more than the one without V2, but you have the amount about me. You have display name. You have given name, which is, I believe, your first name. You have an ID. You have a job title. You have an email. You have a mobile phone. You have your My Site URL. You have your office location, which is actually like the room that you live in, but in your active directory or in your in your profile, whatever is written in office location would appear there. Your preferred language, your preferred name, the state, street address, surname, user principal name, user type, birthday, business phones. Now, I would suggest you try these based on your business scenario, 
I couldn't get hire date to return a value, and I couldn't get birthday to return a value, and I'll show you in the other app as well. Um, they were returning values in related related people, re, re, related people, but they were all the same date. Um, and so I've reported this and we'll see if we can get it fixed. But if you have a problem with any of those, when you're working in this, make sure you post it on the form. Because you know your voice is much louder than mine. If you need something that's not here, or if you're trying to do something that's not working, your raising visibility to that will totally help us to expedite fixes, right? Your voice is much louder than mine. So be sure to post any problems that you have or any properties that don't work when you attempt to use this. I find that the properties that did work were exactly what I would need in most business scenarios. Um, and what one of the, uh, one of the uh, people from the connections team mentioned to me is that if a property is blank, in other words, they don't have anything, it really should show up it should show up as empty. You shouldn't get a false variable. Um, and I'll show you that when we build the app together, uh, just in a couple of seconds. You should get an empty value. So that's why I think it was very clear there were no projects, you know, because it went to zero. So you should either have a zero if you count the rows, or you should have an empty text value. You shouldn't have any false values. So if it shows a date that's not true, then that would be a problem. Okay, so let's close this up. Uh, unless you have any questions about this one, we're going to build the larger one together. And I'm checking for, for questions. <laughs> Stacy said she's glad to see that people at Microsoft don't fill out profile properties as well. No, it's not just you, Stacy, And that's why I bring it out. It's, it's quite typical, um, especially with small to mid-sized businesses, that the, the profile properties can be very sparse. Um, I noticed that usually with larger businesses, they're full-time employees. Like you'll notice that our full-time employees do have a minimum of properties. Like you can't, you can't get you can't be in Delve unless you have a minimum of properties. But what you add after that is kind of like a collaborative effort, you know, and we try to get people to think about Delve and to think about profile properties, but it's not, it's not easy anywhere. Um, uh, Samir, Samir gave us a whole bunch of good points. Samir is from the con Connections team, so he's one of the engineers that I run to when I get stuck. Um, so trust anything that he's typed here. He says that V2 works better in most cases, and it is always recommended to use the latest version of an operation. So if you see multiple versions, then I think what he's saying is to use the latest version. The other thing he pointed out is the UPN, uh, so the user, what is it called, principal name, is a unique ID assigned to every user. Typically, it is the email address. But he brings out a good point that I didn't say. It can be difficult in some cases. For example, if they have aliases for people that differ from their user principal ID uh, name. And so very good point, Samir. It is possible it's different. Um, then he says, the U2 operations tries to handle the anomaly behind the scene, but it may be less performant. So try to use the UPN if it's available. So I think he agrees with me to use the UPN if it's available. Um, and then finally, many people don't fill out a lot. Yeah, yeah, typical, typical, typical. And it depends on every enterprise what they want to enforce as a minimum standard in, the, in that area. So let's try and build something together real quick. So let's do, let's close this down. Samia, thank you so much for adding those thoughts. Better clarifications that really will help, I'm sure. So I'm just going to create a new app. Um, oh, by the way, the reason why this is here is I don't want to forget. A lot of these functions that I'm talking about are going to be shown when you build these templates that are classified as Office. So try the shout outs, try the onboarding, and then look at the functions because that's the functions. You're going to see a lot of the detail of what I'm talking about, but even more detail and give you more ideas on how to use it. If you just build the templates and then go and look at the formulas that are used in the template and how they're used with galleries and so on. 
but let's build our own app together. So, um, and I could have, let me go back to home and show you how I get back to my template. So if I had it on office, now if I go to all, I have to start from blank. And from start to blank, I can choose the widescreen and hit make an app. And basically I will get a blank canvas after I authenticate. And I believe my authentication being so repetitive here has to do with me being in Chrome right now, which is friendlier with Google Hangouts. All right, so now this is loading up and this is my favorite part. It's getting everything ready for me. It's uh, making sure that I have what I need in my tenant and gets me a nice canvas. And we are working so hard to expedite every page load that you get. And I hope that you don't run into the double authentication issue I'm running into. All right, so now here's my blank screen. The first thing I'm going to do is add the Office 365 um, users data connection. Now I actually do have one already because I've been using it, but remember that these are by tenant. Every time I, and, and I'm mean, sorry, not by tenant, by environment. So depending on what environment I'm in, I'm right now I'm in the Microsoft new default environment, I might have different connections already configured. And every time I hit new connection, another one will be added. So to keep your connections neat and clean, don't actually hit new connection unless you don't have it already, because you can reuse them, right? Sometimes I'll do that, it's bad practice. You can see that I have, because I'm doing a demo and I need to show them how to get to new connection, and so I'll do that. All right, so then I'm going to close this once I know that's there, and I'm just gonna insert a gallery. Um, let's insert a horizontal one. Why not pick the template? Um, and then I will not be able to get that connection from here. And this has to do with my habits as well. So when I build apps, I start with my data connections. If you can start with your controls, then you could hit this and add your data source, but it will never actually say the data source here the way it does with tabular connectors like SharePoint or SQL. So, and that's because this panel will always say custom when you're using connectors. But if I go ahead and type this here, so I'm just going to actually type Office 365 users dot, um, let's do uh, relevant people. Relevant people to who? The person looking at the screen. So I'm gonna get their email and then, I'm going to get the value of that. And so this is actually the items property of this gallery for my relevant, my relevant people. Um, and you notice that the panel immediately says custom. And that's what it will always say when you're referring to a non-tabular data source. So don't expect this to say anything but custom when you're dealing with this particular connector. And don't make a mistake of adding the connector again if you've already added it. Um, so you might want to either make it a practice to add the control first, which is hard for me because I, I'm just, just like mentally, I'm trained to add the connections first. Um, but if you can add the controls first, then you, then you don't have to worry about this. But that's just one thing you have to keep in mind. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna make it a lot bigger just because we're gonna focus on relevant people right now. And we're gonna change a few of these things in here just for fun, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do it with this particular image is you recognize that it's, it's from my template. So it's set to a sample image. I can set it to this user's photo, right? So um, I can do Office 3 user photo, user ID is user email, or I could use the Office 365 users and get that UPN if I wanted to, um, but basically this is my, I'm sorry, we do want this to be this item, sorry. Because I want everyone to change, I don't want them all to be me. This item. All right, we might have to change this slightly. So let's do um, user profile. B2, and then um, this item, I believe we have a user principal name. 
And then I want Uh, I might I might have to go peek at my other one to remember. Samira, what am I forgetting here? I'm forgetting something really funny here. Let me go and look at my other one real quick to see what I did for the photo real quick. I expect to do this item there, and, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do, but I'm getting stuck. So let me just take a peek because we'll run out of time. I want to do user photo, right? So user photo, and that's what I had originally. Who's user photo? This item. There we go. You're right. Thank you, Samir. I think what I had done wrong is I, I didn't get this piece right here the first time. So I want the photo and I want the this item. The reason I want to say this item is because this is a gallery, so I want each photo to change. Now, the other thing I'm going to do with this photo is change the height and the width. Now, normally I could do that right over here, but because I use the template, some of these are relative. Um, and because they are relative, the properties panel will kind of point out, hey, that's a function. Right. And so if I click on it, it'll bring me to that function and let me look at it. But I actually don't want that function here. I want to change the size altogether. I'm going to make this 200. Um, I'm sorry, that's not the one I want to change. So I'm going to put that back at 16. I'm going to change my size here to 200. Just highlight this. I don't want it to be relative in this case. And I want my height to be 200. So that they're the same because I want it round just for fun. We're going to set the radius to 200. So if the height, the width, and the radius are the same, you'll get a perfectly round photo. Um, and so I'm going to also center that. So I'm going to align it to top and center so that it's all centered in there. Now, it gives me a lot of heads up space here. So I'm going to fill these in. Basically, I want his display name here. And we can, we can talk about how I handle font sizing and font coloring and all that stuff. Um, but I want to go into just some simple stuff here. I want the vertical align to be middle. I want the um, font size, I need to zoom out a little bit. Sometimes if you miss your PowerPoint ribbon stuff, it's because you're zoomed out, right? I might make this 24 point or I might center this this way. And so now I've got their names. Now, what I might do just to make life easier is control C and control V that as many times as necessary to add the other stuff, right? So let's say I wanna add his job title, Right. And maybe I want to use the proper for this. I can do the proper function around that. And now I've got the job title and I might not put this bold. Right. And so it's very easy for me to kind of progressively just copy and paste and add additional properties. Another thing I might suggest you do that I did in my app is I did auto height on most of these so that they they could be managing the space. You can also do relative positioning between these two so that they always stay together. I always recommend you check out Veronica's blog. And then I'm going to just make this tighter here and a little bit wider here. Now, what I can do for this photo, which is kind of cool. And so I didn't mean to move that. I meant to, I'm gonna put the photo like right there. The, this first name is actually relative to that. That's why when I move the photo down, it goes down here. We're gonna try something a little bit different on this right side. We're gonna add a way to I am him, right? We're gonna I him, and, but I'm gonna actually make this thinner. And again, what this looks like is totally up to your exciting mood. Notice when I move things, I get that little purple dotted line that helps me center things and align things. That purple yellow dot line enables me to do that with my mouse. Um, let's make this 20. All right, so now I'm also kind of looking to the right to see how other things are looking. So maybe what we maybe what we need to do here is wrap this two so that we get more than one. Um, and then 
Yeah, I like it too, wrap two. And then maybe what I will also do, you notice how Greg's photo is kind of choppy? That's because the image position is fit. If I make it fill, then he'll, he will fill out that space. And again, depending on the quality of people's photos that you see, if I give this a theme, I'm gonna give this a theme of gray, uh, that gray. I might actually give the background of the screen a light gray, maybe this one. And then I will give the template fill of these white, get you closer to what you saw me in my other screen. The template fill gives me a way to give a background to each card. I'm kind of making cards, so I need a padding between them. And so the padding for the template gives me some space in between them. And then I can kind of get this exactly the way I want it to look, with a little bit of playing around with template fill, template padding, and so on. Another thing that I kind of like, um, I'm gonna move this down just a little bit and make this a little bit taller. Um, another thing I like to do when it comes to this stuff, by the way, if I manually move this up, it's gonna kill that relative positioning. There is something right here a title field, which is supposed to be his birthday. Notice the birthday is not returned. It could be it's not in their act in not in their profile, right? So what could we put there instead? I noticed that profession doesn't come up either. So it totally depends on what's in their profile and or um, what's available um, in the connector. So I wanted to add one more thing here. I'm just going to add office location and you can kind of see how that would work. Um, another thing I like to do is, I don't really like this scroll bar, but I mean, totally up to you. I turn it off and put on the navigation. Um, and what that does is it gives me a way to scroll this way, right and left, which I like better than the scroll bar, but it's totally up to you how that works. But you can see how quick and easy it is for me to kind of build a UI that shows my related people. Now, one thing I didn't show you how to do is I had put some drop downs at the top. So let's do that. Let's, um, and I'm actually going to put a, a, a chat thing over here on the right as well. So I'm going to move these up. I'm going to make them smaller just for now. Remember, Veronica said the smallest you should get on a mobile app is 14. So remember that. Uh, and I think I'm going to make that. I don't really need the office location. So it's it's gone away. And I went it away without without um, changing the relative positioning. So I will turn it off like this because I don't need it in this one. And so sometimes I'll cheat like that just when I'm running out of time. I just made it invisible because I'd have to move things around to make it not be relative. So one thing I like to do a lot also when I'm working in this is kind of put a drop down up here that I can filter with. So if I take a drop down control up here and I let's say I want to um get that department departments from my user profile i actually have these into the powerpoint deck so that you can see them i'm just going to go really sh quickly show you that in the deck i have a page so you don't have to remember all this with all the formulas already spelled out for you exactly so you can look at them carefully i do want to um point out something in this. I want to break this formula apart for you a little bit. So this is this department function I'm getting ready to show you. And it's actually three parts. So right here is the formula necessary to get the department, right? So basically, this is the ID, which is the mail from the user profile for the person looking at the screen. And then there's the relevant people and the value. Um, but then after the value usually comes the department, um, which is this. Now, what I happen to notice, and don't be afraid to do stuff like this because it can really add to your application when you clean up things like this. What I noticed is when I used this function and got the department, let me just do it so you can see. Uh, sorry. Value dot department. When I got the department this way, what was happening weird? Just kind of wait for this to catch up with me. 
Office 365 users, uh, my profile, the value, the department. And it, okay, so now it comes up. Now, you notice that, first of all, there's gonna be duplicates in here because it's actually giving the department for everybody in my relevant people right now. But you see that little underscore R thing? I hated it, it bothered me. But it's something in my Active Directory that I can't change. So I did two things to make that better. I used my left function to find that underscore and then only give me the left side before that underscore. And that's this left function right here. If you didn't understand me, you can try it and give it a go. But basically the left function says, give me the left side of something. And then it says, well, how many letters do you want me to count, right? So um, in this case, I couldn't tell exactly how many letters it would take to get to the underscore that I didn't like. So I did the find function, which returns the count to that character. And then I minus it by one to get rid of that underscore R. And then the last thing you might have noticed that I also did was use the distinct function. And what the distinct function does is only give me one of each. And I think you've seen that before. So if I go up here and I put this in again, with all of the bells and whistles that I added, notice that the extra underscore R goes away because it's not necessary. And um, I've got only one of each department. So, and you can do that with any of the properties in here. You can actually pull them into a drop down, and then all you do is filter your um, filter your gallery based on that drop down. Are there any questions here? I did take more time than I thought I was going to take, but again, I will add both of these finished apps. Um, to our app gallery. If you look in the description of our, our video today, so just go to the description area of YouTube, you will see that there will be a link where you can vote on more properties in relation to this connector. There'll be a link to get both sample apps from me. You'll be able to download them and use them in your tenant as long as you've got Office 365 users in your tenant. And here are the docs both the Power Apps docs for the user connector and the uh, general docs that kind of break down everything that's returned. So check out the YouTube video to learn more about these different properties. Um, one more page I will show you here is that this connector series started with Planner. For each one, you will have a YouTube video. For each one, you will have an app you can download. Um, next month, we'll be doing project online. But because Office Graph is pretty complicated, you will also see videos from me finishing these two apps, which will happen on Friday. So Friday, you'll have another video, which will be the Friday functions video, which will do the update your profile functions using the connector. And then you'll also get a link to download that app from the Friday's function video. So this particular one, Office Graph will actually have two videos, the webinar plus the Friday functions. And then you will have the apps to review for anything you'd like to use it for. And it will work right out of the box as long as you have Office 365 in your tenant. Um, Marcus said, Samir, um, right, gets more important with our powerful. Exactly. Marcus was saying that the profile gets more important. What's in the Act, Azure Active Directory gets more and more important as we leverage Office Graph and these analytical technologies behind Office Graph. If the profile store is empty, we lose a lot of value. Like you might remember in the other video where I pointed out that you could use department to, to show a control on a field. You could say only the travel department can see this field. But if you don't have the departments in your profile store, then you don't have that capability. So you lose value. So I would encourage all the people around you, go to Delve, fill out your profile properties. Or if you wanna kick it up a notch, make an app to help people fill out their profile properties and share it with your organization. Let me know below if you have questions or if you have wish lists about this, put them in the ideas forum or put them below. We'll make sure we follow up. Uh, Everybody give Samir a big, huge kudos because he drives a lot of this stuff and I don't know what we would do without him. 
So send him a kudos or a hello because Samir is awesome and he works hard to make sure you guys have powerful connections in your apps. So um, I'm going to have to run because time is up, but let me know if you need anything. Thank you so much for coming today. And I will be talking to you soon. Happy power apping.